Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're uh, all wide awake after lunch. There should be a fascinating 30 minutes or so now, hopefully, with one of the most interesting characters in European football. Bruno, good afternoon. I'm not blonde. No, no. So that's not the thing. And my wife is more beautiful than Trump's. Yes, you just called the... So uh, I don't Trump. understand. Yeah. Yeah. But okay. You, you've had a very interesting time at uh, Sporting. Uh, you took over as president in quite difficult times four years ago. Could you just explain just how challenging it was, the finances of the club when you took over, and how you've worked to try to maybe make the club great again? Look, that, that is, uh, is very interesting because I think that uh, this collides with our subjects about the future and the threats. Uh, when we were arrived to the club, we, we were in the time that the Sporting used more funds. Uh, we, we had almost all the players were owned by funds for TPO. So we had a lot of problems. We have more than 500 million in debt. So that was not the way. The way was to... to improve our academy even more, to go stronger with our, our voice and our status, because we were a club that was leaving the, the, the stage and that is not good. And we needed to show that it is possible to make money in football. Uh, and we started work very, very hard and we changed uh, in the first year a lot because we cut it half the costs, uh, but we achieved the second place in the championship. So we went directly to the, to the Champions League. That was something that we, we wouldn't go, I think, for seven or eight uh, seasons. Um, we improved the, the, the money to a debt of something like 240 million. It's a lot, but it's better than 500 million. Uh, we get again the, our players back. We bought them and we started again to have um, the, all the players. That was very, very, very good for our business. And we started to have our own ideas, our own values for football, for the market, for, for Things like TPO, I, I was one of the faces that was against TPO. I was one of the faces that wanted the video uh, uh, referee assistance. And I remember everybody talked that I was crazy because uh, it was not possible to introduce new technologies because football is going, were going to change and is going to die because it's very good to speak about the referees every week and that if TPO didn't exist, the clubs were going to die. So it's very good to be here after almost five years to see Sporting in the, the way that he is. Now, um, a well-spoken club, not only in Portugal, but worldwide. And that we are in a very stable financial situation. In, in, we didn't win the title yet but we are in a good place to, to do it this year, so let's continue to work. But usually what I say to people, it is when we love something, when we believe, when we have the capacity, uh, and in football, when you are a little bit crazy, you achieve your goals. And for those who don't know, TPO is third-party ownership that was outlawed by FIFA, where various investment funds could own parts of players. And you fought some pretty tough battles with big institutions like Doyen Sports over Marcus Rojo, who went to Manchester United. You didn't win in that sort of case. Just how challenging was it? And what did you learn about some of the way football is run uh, from, from those battles that you had to wage? First, I learned that Doyen is not an institution because to be an institution, we need to understand what is Doyen and nobody understands. So first, the first lesson it is Doyen is not an institution, is something, I don't know what. How we lose it, it is something that uh, the world of football needs to understand. Uh, there is a lot of, to change, of course, because when you, you fight with someone or something that even WEF and FIFA are against, 
when you don't understand where the owners, where is the money from, where the people, you don't understand nothing, and they can win it, it means that football has a hard way uh, to, to walk, and it's very far from his best destiny. So, as I said it in that day, it was a sad day for football, not only for sporting, it was a sad day for football, because something that nobody knows very much what it is, one, and that is very, very bad. But uh, we are here, we, we, we managed to, to deal with, with that. Uh, sometimes in, in life you, you lose and it isn't fair, sometimes you win and it isn't fair also. So we need to, to continue to, to, to follow our beliefs and if we need to fight these kind of wars, we will fight it. There is no, no problems. We are in Portugal, the home of the super agent, perhaps Jorge Mendes. You have to deal naturally with agents so much of the time. Dealing with them, how uncomfortable do you find it? Particularly the money that is leaving the game, the commissions. Is that something that you want to tackle? Do you think football should be doing more to clamp down on the amount of commissions, intermediaries, agents are actually uh, gaining? and maybe some see as their influence on certain clubs. I have here some, some figures that I think that they are very interesting for us to understand what we are dealing with. Um, from 2013 to 2016, it was paid 1.1 billion in commissions. We are speaking about uh, US dollars. It is something like 950 million euros. Um, if we put this in a basis of 14 years, in a simple mathematic account, it is plus five, it was three years, um, we have something like 4.4 billion uh, in commissions paid, but this is only mathematic. For us to understand, in that 14 years, Jorge Mendes made transfers of 1.2 billion. So, uh, yes, he is a very big agent. Uh, not only sporting needs to deal, it's, it's a worldwide agent. And when you see that you have a market of commissions for 14 years, something like 4.4 billion, and that Jorge Mendes has business uh, in the same time of 1.2 billion, it, it is a lot. So it's, it's growing the influence of the agents, it is true. It's growing a lot, the commissions. Uh, we need to understand that uh, the commissions are growing like the double that they were in 2010. Um, only the big five uh, has a lot. I want something very, very interesting. It is um, when we speak about commissions, we are speaking about 2016. England engaging, this is buying 350 million in commissions paid, selling 31 million in commissions paying. So, we buy, we pay, and we pay even plus 350 million in commissions. This is the engaging clubs, not selling ones. In Italy, 195 million in commissions in the engaging clubs, not selling. Selling it was something like 56. So, um, this is growing. This is, this, this is something crazy, but this is also football. Uh, and I think everything is, is changed that, that what it needs to be. I know that England, uh, if we see the studies, don't make a, a lot of effort in, in creating their own players. They are more a, a, a league that buys players and not form players but it's a lot of money to pay in, in commissions. It's a lot of money. 
Um, and you need to put above the price of the players, of course. And you had a big battle with one Premier League club, West Ham, over one of your players. That it, was it, not it, a big fight. Yeah. It's, to have a, a big fight, I need to be interested in the fight, and I'm not interested yeah. in West Ham, so it was not a big fight. <laughs> What, what do you, you think should be done to actually clamp down on the agent world? You seem to think there is a problem with it with these no, crazy numbers. Should I'm transfers be eradicated, the fees? Or, I'm, not, uh, I'm not speaking about if it is a problem or not problem. What we need to understand it is um, every time the, the agents have more pow power because the players, um, and we speak a lot uh, with my friend, Bobby Barnes from Fifth Pro, the players are becoming very much afraid uh, to do something without their agents to, to, to intervene. So uh, the question is, are the agents here to facilitate the business or are the agents here only to win money with the deals? Because uh, uh, sometimes I find agents that are in the market to help the business to, to, to appear. Sometimes I, I, I see the agents, I have things like, okay, the deal is almost done. And what FIFA says it is, first the clubs need to find an agreement, then the club, the buying club can speak with the, the player. That is the rule, nobody do it, but we do it. But I think we are one of the clubs, the only club in the world that do it, but let's see. Um, what happened it is you go to the, 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 the player's agent and they, he said, I will not win nothing with the transfer, so my, my player is, is not going. He's not going. Why? Because I don't win nothing. So, and if you win something, uh, if I win, I will speak to my player. Maybe he can come. Um, we need to create rules. Uh, I don't say that they, are, they need to go like TPO. What I say it is we need to have rules, uh, very concrete rules, uh, regarding a lot of things. TPO change for ownership, we were, were speaking about that. And I'm, I'm saying who is doing something about that. Okay, they change. They are not using the investment funds in buying... Uh, players, but they are using the investment funds to buy clubs. So, who is going to put their hand in this? It's the federations? I don't believe. It's the leagues? I don't believe. It needs to be the governments. We are speaking about a, a market that direct market is something like 30, 33 uh, uh, billion. Uh, it's a lot of money. It is the same of the industry of Hollywood. It is more than the famous uh, uh, sports in the US. It's more than all the other sports together. So the governments need to do something about regulating the intermediary uh, um, agents um, part in the deals. He needs to do something about the ownership. You need to understand if that ownership is not making something uh, against the integrity of football, um, it's that company, that person, it own, owns only one club, several clubs from the same uh, championship, from several championships. Are they playing together? Are they not playing together? And this is one of the fights that I have. Um, I don't believe that we have the capacity to solve these issues, the future of football. Um, in the level of federations and leagues. I don't believe. I think that the governments need to say present. We are speaking about one of the most important industries of the world. And if this is not an industry for the, for the government to do something, I don't know what it is. And I see the governments every time trying to, to get away. I don't know if you know, but 19% of the European clubs don't have their accounts public, 90%. So you have a very dark hole in football. And we are speaking in Europe, 90% don't have their accounts public. This is very serious. And if the government continues to whistle 
and do nothing, I think it's very bad for football. We do see a lot of money coming in, particularly from China, where perhaps we're unsure of the origins. We see a lot of golf investment in football clubs across Europe. How do you, as a club in Portugal, challenge, particularly in Europe, against these super clubs in other leagues, these leagues generating far more in television revenue? What ambitions do you set yourself and how do you challenge against those to, to find a position in the global game? And where do you see the global game going in the position, particularly for sporting? Look, you now have something like 44 clubs in the big five that uh, are owned by, by someone. Um, you have 18 different nationalities owning that 44 clubs. Um, the last takeovers, the 10 takeovers, eight were from China, but you have 18 different nationalities. And every time, uh, um, I don't understand why clubs uh, don't, don't understand that their business can be profitable. We were the only administration in sporting that had uh, a full four-year mandate uh, positive, the only one. And we had positive by uh, making good management and buying good and selling good. We, we had a record in, in the revenues uh, last season something like 170 million what the clubs are making it is they are forgetting all of this and only trying to attract money from stakeholders from private people from companies from investment funds and they don't have the the capacity to understand that they are they, they are going to lose their their um their need for a, um, a situation that the fans continue to be the owners of the club, that the fans continue to be proud of their club, because you can be owner of a club and change the colors, the logo, um, even the names. You have everything in the world. So I'm very afraid when I see a Harvard study that says that 65 to 75 percent of European clubs are in bankruptcy or near bankruptcy and 60 percent of the clubs in the world and in the same stage I'm very afraid for me I want to continue that sporting continues to be owned by the fans because that is the essence of football that is the essence of this market and for that I put it and invested a lot in our academy. We are the only club in the world with two golden balls. It is Luis Figo and Cristiano Ronaldo. We have a lot of players that a lot of uh, clubs want. It is, you have a lot of English clubs, Italian clubs, Spanish clubs to want the, the players that we have uh, made and we have in, still in our, in our academy. And with that product that we have, that we are the best in producing the best players in, in the world, we have 55 players in the, f the big five leagues. But you're losing playing. them, you're struggling to no, keep no, them, but is that the I, challenge? I still have a lot because of that, Barcelona and Juventus had a lot of trouble and they have much, much more money than we have and they had a lot of trouble. To, to win the game and now Juventus it was a draw so um, and even I need to to say that the the referees were not so good in these games against Barcelona and Juventus but okay it's it's like people say uh, they want sexy clubs uh, in the Champions League I prefer good clubs and to have good clubs I prefer to see sporting in the Champions League I don't understand what is a sexy club but maybe one day someone is going to, to show me what is a sexy club. What I want it is for people to understand that in the future you need to, to put money in your academies, you need to create talent, you need to realize that it is your business also to buy, to sell, to make your business. You need to engage with the fans in all the ways that you can using the new platforms because TV is going to decrease every year their audience and you need to find ways to arrange money with the fans 
creating awareness in the world, it's what, it is what we do, and creating money through the academy, it is creating players that every team in the world wants to play it. And it's our success in these five years. It is what we are doing, and we are doing very successful, and that is very good. And in the future, clubs that don't understand this will be in bankruptcy or owned, and maybe they can get the name, they, they can still have the name, because one day they are going to change everything. And I love Sporting Club of Portugal. I don't love any kind of other sporting that an uh, owner can come and change. Uh, that, that is not football for me. That is not the business for me. The television situation you referenced there, and we are sort of running out of time, but we've heard here in earlier sessions, and this is a technology summit as well, but television audiences traditionally are going down where you rely on for television income so often at football clubs. Is that a threat or is it an opportunity, things like Netflix and uh, streaming platforms to actually bring in a new audience? And how do you engage an audience of the future when they're switching off traditional television uh, action and not necessarily watching a full 90-minute match? Every new opportunity becomes uh, uh, before it is a threat. So you, we, we need to look at life and see the threat as new opportunities. Of course, that almost all the clubs uh, receive a lot of money from the TV rights, so it's a very important revenue for the clubs. But now we need to look to the web, we need to look to the, to, to the new platforms, and we need to create forms to engage and to understand that it's very, very simple to get uh, all the world uh, to see your club and to engage to your club if you put money in the digital area and in the new platform area. And uh, Sporting is also uh, trying to improve what it is, uh, uh, their awareness in these fields, because in the future we need to be able to secure the connection through the fans for other means than not only the TV, because it is true. I think that we have, and the Harvard study says, more five years of this madness, the increase, in the, the increase of the market, the, these figures, everything. But I think that after these five years, the ones that are prepared and are connected to the fans from the other sides, from other bases, from other platforms, are going to be the ones that are going to survive. And that is very important also for the clubs to understand. First, to create value by the players from the academies. Second, they need to look to other forms to have revenues in the club because the TV rights are going up, but very fast are going to come down. And if we are not prepared, the reality is going to be a, sh a shock. So the threat needs to become a, the new opportunity. And I think it is a new opportunity. And we see in this web summit that the new technology, it is the future. So we are in the right place for people to start to make networking and start to make, to give money for the new technologies because it is the future of connection and to create value for the clubs. And what does the future of a football club look like? Uh, you do things like you've, you've diversified into Paralympic sports and various other elements to engage the public. Is that key for the future, to safeguard the future of clubs by engaging with your fan base? I'm going to say something very fast. In the construction business, there was one time that people thought that it was very good to put everything in the, in the industry carpentry, uh, the aluminium, so the, the companies became a monster. I think football is it's the same. Uh, we are creating a monster. We, we think that we need everything, and in the end, in the future, we are only going to be the club. We are going again to the basis. Club, fans, players, revenue. I think in the future, we are going to lose this, this dimension, stratospheric and very strange, and go again to the basic. And the basic, it is the best element for a club, it is their fans. And the best thing to do to the fans, it is to honor their clubs, is history, and to give them more and more value.
through the club. But because you referred something about Paralympics, I want to give you something. Uh, okay. Because this is a summit not only to say bad things. Uh, sporting has the second equipment this year is made by the fans. We believe a lot in the power of the fans. So since this year the second equipment is designed by the fan and as our motto, our values written in Braille because we have a social responsibility, effort, dedication, devotion, that is glory. So this is all also an innovation. The fans are the base and equality for everybody because everybody should be united in this wonderful game that is football. This is for you, Rob. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Yeah.